when doubt is very deep, when doubt is really deep, when we get sunk in it, we get paralyzed. And I've worked with a lot of people that the very things they need to be doing to help them get healthy and free, they can't do because the doubt is so deep. The sense that there's no possibility is like a prison. That is the suffering of doubt. The Buddha described it, this is the fifth of the five difficult forces the Buddha talked about, and in many ways it's the most difficult. Because we get completely stuck in our tracks. There's no energy. So how do we work with it? Okay, because this is... And we'll see how far we get tonight, we'll continue it next week, but... We have this experience of severed belonging, we act out of it, we get locked into a sense of who I am is small and not okay, doubt. So, I think that one of the best stories in the myth of the Buddha is the story of the Buddha sitting under the Bodhi tree, that whole night he spent in some way dealing with the challenging energies, just like we do in life and in retreat or wherever we are, He dealt with it the way we practice of bringing presence and compassion. The attack on him of these difficult forces, of course it was his own shadow, but it was called Mara, the energy of Mara, the god of greed, hatred and delusion. So Mara just was hurling all night these these arrows and bows and slings and whatever. The Buddha is meeting it with this great heart and great presence each thing that was hurled at him got transformed into a flower petal, fell down at his feet until there was a great heap in front of him as the morning star came out. And the Buddha was still not free. That's when Mara issued his final challenge. And I'm wondering how many of you know what that is, the final challenge, what is it? Who do you think you are? It's a great challenge. Who do you think you are? It's that basic challenge that says you don't deserve either to exist or be loved or be approved. And certainly for the Buddha who is taking the seat of awakening, you don't deserve to be awake. Who do you think you are, you know? So, Through the night, the Buddha had been meeting Mara with this presence, but he shifted his strategy then. And this is why I like the story so much. He didn't make a spiritual muscle and say, I'll show you who I am. He reached down and he touched the earth. He called on the earth goddess to bear witness. Now what this means is, rather than any sense of, I, my spiritual prowess can meet this challenge, he called on his larger belonging to earth, to the web of life, to the uh, sacred feminine, the beloved. He called on presence and love, he touched the earth. And in response, the skies darkened and there were lightning bolts and thunder and the whole deal and Mara withdrew. (laughs) So it worked, (laughs) it was a good strategy. And the Buddha was free. That was the moment of freedom when he met the final greatest challenge of doubt, when he touched the earth, when he called on his belonging, he realized his belonging. It was in realizing the truth of who he was that he became free. The reason I like this myth so much is because we can get deluded into thinking we're we're sharpening our spiritual skills so we can handle the attacks of our shadow. And that's another version of spiritual ego. When we in some deep way sense, wait a minute, everything, every bit of what I'm experiencing belongs to something larger. It belongs to awareness, aliveness, love. In those moments, we're coming home, and that's when our faith shines brilliantly, like all the stars in the universe, because we know who we are. That's the freedom from the egoic self. It doesn't mean the egoic self disappears. 
It doesn't need to disappear. We need an ego. Ego is part of our survival strategy. We need a body. We need a nervous system. We need fear. We just don't have to be possessed or defined by it. In Sanskrit it's called jivan mukta. Awake, it means dying while yet here. You die to the ego and you're still living on this earth. You can have the ego be like a servant, an instrument, but you know who you are. Okay, so the practice that develops this confidence, this light of faith, I'm going to call it for now touching the ground. And what it means is that we begin to entrust ourselves to something larger. And what we're entrusting ourselves to, and this will be the rest of the evening, what we'll explore, could be considered entrusting ourselves to the whole life of the present moment. In other words, we're letting go of all control and just saying, okay, I'm opening to exactly the life that's here. That's in a way entrusting ourselves to the earth, to nature, to the nature of aliveness of right now. And the second, when we touch the earth, we're calling on love. We're calling on the goddess, the heart of the goddess. So let's talk about these two ways of entrusting. Just to say that Mahatma Gandhi described this process as dissolving ourselves to zero. That as we entrust ourselves to our true belonging, that that ego self uh, dissolves. And that's when we become a vessel for soul force. This is a sneak preview of the next talk because the next talk will be describing when we open to our true belonging, when we have that faith, we become a vehicle. So, the pathway. The first pathway, belonging to the moment. Our faith grows as we can let go into our moment-to-moment experience. In some ways, when it's difficult, we're learning to stay. Our faith grows when we stay with things and discover the things we were running away from that we actually can be with and handle. And that frees us because if we know we can handle it, as I mentioned early, our body doesn't have to tense against what's around the corner. There's so many moments when we watch ourselves that our mind and body's leaning forward, anticipating. Now, when it's really difficult, and this is the inquiry of how do we have the confidence to just stay when it's really difficult. One of the things that Chogyam Trungpa call, describes is when, when we encounter that kind of difficulty is to actually go towards the unpleasantness. Now, he doesn't even say just open to it, he like literally go towards it, lean into it. Let's see if I can... Uh, I had a lovely description of it from him, but I don't know if I have it right here. Ah, here we go. So here's what he writes. He says, he talks about turning toward the emotion. He says, go through it, give into it, experience it. And when you begin to experience this process of going towards emotion, towards the fear or the grief or the anger, rather than emotions coming towards you, then you begin to make a journey. Turning toward means encountering with mindfulness, but not like a detached observer. It's a mindfulness that's entirely engaged and contactful. That last part is is my description of it. Many people think of mindfulness as, you know, going to sit back and open and notice what's happening. And that very word, notice, it makes a distance. Contacting. Why? Because whenever things are difficult, the way our sense of self emerges is in the way we tense against it. Our resistance gives us our sense of egoic self. In the moment that you actually go towards it, that you intentionally move right into the experience, 
you have put down that resistance and the self dissolves, the sense of self dissolves. There's a freedom there. So our minds tell us otherwise. Our minds tell us to, when things are difficult, keep figuring things out, keep judging, you know, keep doubting. One woman says, this is Shira Milgram, she says, if logic tells you life is a meaningless accident, don't give up on life, give up on logic. If your mind is telling you spend more time figuring things out, preparing, rehearsing, judging, you know, see if you can let it go and actually come into where the body is living. That's the beginning of really touching the ground. We touch the ground when we come into the body. Fearing Paris. Suppose that what you fear could be trapped and held in Paris. Then you would have the courage to go everywhere in the world, all the directions of the compass open to you, except the degrees east or west or true north that lead to Paris. Still, you wouldn't dare put your toes smack dab on the city limit line. You're not really willing to stand on a mountainside miles away and just watch Paris lights come up at night. Just to be on the safe side, you decide to stay completely out of France but then the danger seems too close even to those boundaries and you feel the timid part of you covering the whole globe again. You need the kind of friend who learns your secret and says, see Paris first. See Paris first. So what are you running away from? That's the place to lean in. There's a saying in the uh, Dharma teacher circle that you're only as good as your last Dharma talk. (laughs) It's a terrible saying, it's a terrible idea, especially for those of us that speak a lot, because (laughs) no matter what it sounds like inside us, we've got all these computations of what's working and not working. So for me, I would, you know, because I talk a lot, you know, and there are many talks that my idea of what I wanted doesn't happen, you know, what I wanted to express and, you know, sometimes they're a little bit garbled in my mind or not clear and sometimes they're too long. You know, at the last retreat it was definitely one was too long and I went going, oh, you know. But so, some years ago when I, you know, I noticed afterwards the proliferation, I'd give a talk when and when I didn't like it I'd, you know, kind of walk around in a funk some, you know, a little embarrassed to myself. And it would color things. Well, I started uh, writing Radical, uh, not Radical Acceptance, True Refuge about five or six years ago and, and really started exploring what we're talking about tonight, which is faith. It's like, okay, if you really trust, if you really have faith, how are you going to hold these things? And this thing of, well, when something comes up, the pathway to faith, in those moments, it's just to touch the ground, just to enter in, turn towards the feeling. In Pali, the word for faith is translated as resting your heart in what is true. Resting your heart in what is true. So the pathway to faith is to rest your heart in what is true, resting your heart in the truth of the present moment, resting your heart in the truth of love. So I began practicing that. I would come out of a talk that was, yeah, and I would, could feel myself kind of contracted. And I go, oh, okay. I get interested. I say, okay, this is a chance. So rest your heart in that feeling, that kind of yucky feeling. And I would just start breathing. And, and resting your heart has such a, it has a kindness to it too. So I would just be with it, be with it. And what I'd find is when I leaned in, when I leaned into the feeling, that sense of an ego self that was evaluating herself started dissolving and there just became changing sensations and feelings and sounds and the space they were happening in. And then just the remembrance again of who I am underneath all that ego conditioning. So this is the pathway to faith. And the more times that we move from that place of, I am this ego that is in some way not okay, to remembrance, faith gets stronger. That sense of, oh, 
I can handle this life. That confidence grows. So this is the first of the uh, pathways. And just take a moment, we'll just practice for a moment to give you a taste yourself if you want to close your eyes. Consider this a pause. And like all pauses, it's an opportunity just to come right here. Whatever you've been thinking about, whatever I've been talking about, it's history. Just let yourself arrive. You might feel the breath. Zen master Ryokan says, drift east. If you want to know the Buddhist law, drift east, drift west, entrusting yourself to the waves. So this is the first pathway to faith, this touching the ground, entrusting ourselves to the waves of the moment. So sense what that means to you right now. What does it mean right this moment to entrust yourself to the waves? It's just to rest your heart in what is true right here, right now. This pathway to faith takes an attentiveness. You have to notice the waves, what's here, what's happening and then sense the entrusting. What happens when your body entrusts itself to the waves? You sense a kind of surrendering presence in your body. What happens when your heart entrusts itself to the waves? When you rest your heart in what is true. It's a deep letting go into what is. And it's not just one letting go. You let go and then you let go of the letting go until you just sense the waves are happening, the sounds, the sensations. And you can begin to sense the oceanness, the presence that it's happening in. this vast wakefulness. As faith grows, there's a sense it's really okay, whatever waves come and go. This remembrance of oceanness can include all the waves. If you trust you're the ocean, you're not afraid of the waves. Now opening your eyes. So one pathway, touching the ground. This is this letting go into the waves, the second pathway. The Buddha called on the earth goddess to bear witness. We call on love. I'll give you a, a share, an example that happened at retreat with one, one friend who, um, she called, her way of, um, this is going to sound grandiose, she called on the earth goddess by calling on me to bear witness to something. 
Uh, forgive me if it sounds grandiose, because it was really, it was actually cute, because she had heard this story, so, <laughs> of the Buddha, you know, touching the ground. And her, what she was bringing was uh, re- something really poignant, which is, she said, that um, she has a kind of neurosis that feels so embarrassing that it's really hard to say out loud, but she moves around feeling like in some way everybody's looking at her. She goes, I feel like people are always looking at me and watching me and judging me and sometimes judging me maybe positively, but then I'm going to let them down and sometimes negatively. But in some way I'm always thinking people are, are, are kind of tracking what's going on with me. And she said, that is just so narcissistic and it's so embarrassing to tell you. And so in a way she was saying, you know, bear witness, let me know it's not terrible. Which is of course what I did, you know, I said, there are a lot of us, I mean, we're, we're all self-referential, we all in some way feel like it's, we're center stage and the rest of the world are props and, you know, everything's on us and um, we affirm our existence all the time that way and um, a lot of us are very vigilant and the more that we had a dangerous background, the more we're constantly computing what's going on with other people vis-a-vis moi. Well, that mirroring was a really big relief to know it was normal, it was okay, she was not sick. And what happened was, by having somebody that she trusted, cared about her, mirror that, made it okay enough that she could then just start paying attention to the pain of it. And then she could begin to bring compassion, her own compassion, to just this tendency to be so self-absorbed, which is painful, it hurts. So this is just an example of she, she reached out, she called on something that she felt was larger to reflect, you're okay, and we need to do that. We need the mirroring of each other. It's part of the power of 12-step groups that we realize that whatever we've been feeling so ashamed about there's a lot of other people that are, have that same conditioning that life's, lives have played out in the same painful ways, we're not alone. There are many ways of touching the ground and calling on love. The metta practice is a beautiful way of calling on love, just to keep on training ourselves to pay attention to the goodness. That wakes up a sense of larger belonging to pay attention to the vulnerability in each other and sensing it's shared. There's research on couples that love, you know, very loving couples that I, that I think is great where, you know, you see how w- if the woman is given a shock in her ankle, this is kind of groundbreaking research at the time, they measured the amount of anticipatory anxiety for the shocks and the actual pain. Then they did the whole thing again, holding the hand of her husband. This is with good relationships. Holding the hand of her husband, redid the measurements, everything's reduced. There is no limit to what love affords us. When we feel belonging, a larger belonging, we can handle living and dying. I've seen it again and again. Uh, Dan Gottlieb, story, uh, Dan Gottlieb, He's a, a radio show host of very popular uh, Voices in the Family, Philadelphia, and a wonderful guy. And when he was much younger, I don't know his age, I think in his 30s, he was you know, getting going as a psychologist when he got into a terrible car accident. He was in you know, intensive care for quite a while, paraplegic, has lived since then as a paraplegic. There was a while when he was in the hospital that he uh, didn't know if he could live. He didn't know if he wanted to live. In fact, he thought he didn't want to live. So there he is um, in the ICU and his, this nurse came up to him and knew, had heard of him and said, oh, so you're, you're a psychologist, can I talk to you? And she, she talked to him for a while about the pain in her life. She was suicidal and just told him uh, what was going on and he, he could really feel, very, deep, deep sense of compassion and so on and, and offered her that, that presence. I think it was the next morning she came back and said, you know, that talk, it really, it really made a difference. When she left, 
that was the moment that he closed his eyes and he said, I can live with this. I can live with this. Now what had happened? He went from the severed belonging state of an ego who felt no longer do I have anything to offer, any reason to be alive, to realizing, oh, I belong. I belong. He felt his belonging. That enlargement reconnected with his beingness. He knew he could be part of this life. Love is always here, presence is here, awareness is here, but we're not always connected to it. So this path of awakening faith is touching the ground, it's reconnecting, but it's hard because our conditioning is to run away. So this is a poem, David White. He says, I want to write about faith, about the way the moon rises over cold snow night after night, faithful even as it fades from fullness, slowly becoming that last curving and impossible slither of light before the final darkness. But I have no faith myself, I refuse it the smallest entry. Let this then, my small poem, like a new moon, slender and barely open, be the first prayer that opens me to faith. Let this then, my small poem, like a new moon, slender and barely open, be the first prayer that opens me to faith. So even as we touch the ground, if all that we do is pray to be open, pray to trust in our potential, that opens the door for some light to shine through. So let's close for just a few minutes, coming with our eyes closed. Again, in this simple way, sensing what does it mean to entrust myself to the waves? What does it mean to entrust myself to love, to rest my heart in love? You might even bring to mind a person where loving comes easily. Just a feel sense of the shared loving there. the goodness of that relationship, what you appreciate. To feel the shared loving and then just let the idea of that person vanish and just feel the love and let it be as big as it is. Can you rest your heart in that loving? Can you sense as you rest your heart in presence and love just the beingness that's here? That which you are behind any of the conditioning. Loving awareness. So Gil Rinpoche says, if everything changes, then what is really true? Is there something behind the appearances, something 
boundless and infinitely spacious in which the dance of change and impermanence takes place. Is there something in fact we can depend on that does survive what we call death? May our trust in timeless, loving presence deepen. May that trust free us to live from that loving presence. May all beings live from loving presence. May all beings awaken and be free. Namaste. Namaste.